All right, everybody, we're back with Complete Sentences Podcast. Um, we have a very special guest here. I'm so happy that you could call in. We have actress Jessica Cameron with us. So happy that uh, that we get, we're able to, to make the time to get this going. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you. You know, you're the first actress that we've had on the show. Really? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. I feel honored. <laughs> We've had a lot of a lot of different you know authors and, and different things like that, but the first the first actress. So I'm gonna have a lot of questions for you about the uh, about the art form. I hope you're ready for that. Oh, absolutely! I love talking about that. So go. All right, cool. And it's funny. I there's some people that like get really upset. I'll warn you now. Uh, some actresses who, if you call them actresses, they'll freak out because they they like to you know actors. It's like this weird. Uh, weird thing that some people do in our industry and I find it highly entertaining and it makes me laugh whenever an actress looks at me and says I'm not an actress I'm an actor oh wow I didn't even know that was a thing yeah yeah it's a total thing I I, I don't want to call anybody out but I know that my friend was just in a meeting with a established screen queen of somebody like the screen queen that everyone knows of and she she had a big problem with him referring to her as an actress Wow! Oh, well, I have to remember that. I should have. I should. I didn't even think about that before I asked you. I could have totally just I'll like. I'll answer. I don't care personally. I just. I think it's it's comedic. And whenever you mention that, I was like, I oh, should let him know so that he doesn't, you know, get wow. upset. You know, get upset if an actress sits down. Right. Well, that's that's one of the things that seems kind of fun, also about being being an actor or an actress of some type, is that in a lot of interviews. It seems like they're being difficult just for fun. You know, like a lot of people just get really weird about stuff. Like, you can't ask me about that. I completely agree. Yeah, it's just, it's funny. That's when you just sometimes have to look at them and laugh. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, so I guess, well, the first question is, I mean, how did you get involved with acting? Like, what, 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 made, it, what made it a go for you? You know what, it's actually an interesting story. I, it was one of the things that I wanted to do when I was a kid, and I was very analytical as a child. And I had bad teeth, so I kind of completely pushed it off because I was like, whatever, I have bad teeth, I can't do it. However, uh, I, I, I became a fashion designer and I did other creative things. And I was in high school, like it sort of came back around and my teacher really wanted to get involved. She was like, you're really good. I was like, no, I don't really care to, you know, for the, the other actors in my high school, so I, I pushed it off again, and then when I was in school, in university, it came around where, like, managers just would see me at the bar that I was working at, and be like, you're an actor, I was like, no, I'm not, um, and then ironically enough, after I graduated university, some Canadian, so it's not college, it's university, uh, unfortunately, and I got a quote-unquote real job, um, and moved to uh, Ohio, my boss had a big problem at my three months, like, uh, touch base, and it was simply the fact that I spoke too fast. Really? Really. So so she she thought it was a joke, but it came from her boss's boss. So because of that, uh, she was like, you know, just take a class. And when I couldn't find a class, she was like, take an acting class and then just talk slowly around the stupid people. And I was like, cool, that I can do. And that's exactly what I did. And then you got bit by the acting bug. You know what? It was one of those things where it was like a horrible time in my life because I was having a huge like mid early twenty tw- crisis kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, because I I'd realized that I went to school and studied and spent all this money to do something that I didn't like the practical use of. Yeah, um, I, I'm going through the same thing right now. That's really interesting. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, like they're like, oh my god, what have I done? This sucks. You know what I mean? Because like I, I had loved fashion so much in school, and I loved the idea of it, and I loved doing what I like to do with it. But in real life, it was a boring desk job, and part of the thing that I love about it, or what I thought about it was that it wasn't. Um, so to do it corporately or to make any money off of it, you kind of have to just suffer through the boring desk job. Um, so it was amazing for me, because what happened was I found something that made my boring desk job okay. You know, I could suffer through, you know, 14 hours of borderline slave labor that I hated just so I could get to that acting class, just so I could, you know, rehearse that scene. And it was creative and challenging and difficult and pushed everyone I had and took me out of my comfort zone. And I just loved it. So I, for years, I just took classes. That's all I did. I just took classes on evening and weekends in Ohio and all the surrounding states. You could drive to like Michigan and Pennsylvania and Kentucky and all these places. Um, so I would drive to just take whatever classes or workshops I could. And after about two years of that, 
my acting coach was like, you know, you have to, you just have to start working because there's no classes for you to take. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not really, you know, I wasn't looking for a second job. I wasn't looking, you know, my fashion job was paying my bills and it was paying them very comfortably. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had like, you know, the best of both worlds, you know, where I was making a really good living, um, doing the thing that I hated, but then I had, you know, because I'm Canadian, so we tend to be workaholics a bit, so I could work, you know, for, you know, 65 hours a week, 70 hours a week, and then I could still fit in 20 hours of acting stuff. Pretty Holy easy. cow, that's that's, cra- so, that's a crazy amount of time. Yeah, it is, but like, when you like, you just do it, yeah. you know, like, it, it wasn't an issue because I loved it so much, you know, I literally just would, like, eagerly power through my day to get to the next class, to get to this, to get to that. And the cool thing about when you work so much, you don't really have time to sort of stop and be like, wow, I hate this, but I love this. Right. So So when I started, then I started, when I ran out of classes, I just started uh, auditioning. And luckily for me, Ohio is a, what they call like a, a weekend warrior sort of market, which basically means that there's a lot of filmmakers where they have day jobs. So a lot of filming takes place evening and weekends. So, it wasn't uncommon for me to, you know, leave work at like 8.30, drive a half hour or two of sets, you know, be in makeup for 45 minutes, shoot for five or six hours, get home at like 3.30, you know, sleep for three, four hours, wake up, go to the day job and repeat. Um, you know, and I did that for a couple of years as well until I finally felt that I cut down all my expenses and I could live comfortably on very little money and then... You know, it was time to, to get rid of the day job. Right. Well, and that's strange, too, because I, I wouldn't really picture Ohio being a place where an actor can really, like, you know, get their feet wet. That's that's pretty interesting. Well, you know what? The reality of the matter is everywhere it is. Technology today has made filmmaking so expansive that everywhere in America and Canada, there's people filming something. You know, you just can't get away from it. You know, there's people in Arkansas, Oregon, you know, they're everywhere. And the good news, honestly, with Ohio, you know, if you're dedicated, you can just, Ohio's ideal, honestly, for me personally, if I had to live anywhere and work a day job somewhere and then do acting on the side, Ohio's a perfect market because you get all these people that are doing it because they love it. They, there's a lot of people in Ohio, especially, who uh, know how no technical filmmaking skills because there's a lot of industrial and a lot of commercial. So you get these people that do these, like, $200,000 McDonald's campaign commercials, you know, Monday through Friday night, 9 to 5. Right. And it's filmmaking, but it's not narrative. You know, it's not a story. And they just want to tell a story on the weekend. So they'll make a kick-ass short or they'll make something else, but it's well lit, the sound is good, the quality is really high. And then on top of it with Ohio, what's really nice, it's like you're a three hour drive from Michigan, Pennsylvania, Indiana, uh, you know, West Virginia, Kentucky, your six hour drive to Chicago, nine hour drive to New York. You know what I mean? So you're really not impossibly far from anyone. Right. You know, and it's just a matter of, is it easy to like, you know, work all week and then wake up, you know, Saturday morning at four in the morning so you could drive five hours to a film set. Not easy, but if you love it, you do it. That's a really good point. Um, it se- it does seem like you know in a smaller, not necessarily like a smaller state, but compared to like the West Coast with filmmaking. If you're in Ohio, a lot more people seem like they're they're doing it and they're they're doing it with not enough money, but they're doing it for the uh, for like uh, the love of it, you know. Absolutely. And that's exactly what I was. So, you know, it, you know, and it, it was great because I found that I was still getting, what I hated about that was that I wasn't getting enough creative fulfillment, you know, and I was hating it. So I found a way to get that creative fulfillment and still uh, not drastically change careers until I was ready, you know, because like the reality of the matter is it takes you years before you can earn a living and then it's going to be a very small one. You know right. what I mean? So so just being like, I'm going to be an actor, and then dropping out of it. You know, you have to have a resume, a real, um, you know, a website. You have to have all these things. You just do. Well, be- before we get into you taking taking the jump to uh, move to the West Coast, w- describe to me your first audition. <laughs> that is actually a funny story. Uh, it, was for, uh, it was for a movie called The Dead Matter. 
And it was with a director called Ed Douglas, who I'm still friends with today, and I adore that man. I think so very highly of him. Uh, he's wonderful. And it was actually held at Precinct 13, which is a studio. It's in Mansfield, Ohio, which is about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes north of, of Ohio, or of Columbus. So we had a little bit of a drive there. Um, and Robert Kurtzman is an icon, in my opinion, as well as a wonderful human being, but just an absolute icon. You know, he did the Wishmaster series sure. and a bunch of other stuff that's very well known. Um, so when I found out that this was like my first audition, it was kind of crazy. It was such a big one for me. So I went into the studio and it's like the coolest thing ever and they have all of their like pieces and work that they've done. So there's like pieces from the Wishmaster set. There's, you know, the blast story that Robert Kurtzman's character like went through. There's, you know, these monsters and beasts and, you know, the snake from Jennifer Lynch's film and all this other crazy stuff. So, and it's so distracting. Um, and then they had me read, which was a generic side. It was just like a, a random side meeting. It wasn't specifically to any any one role or character. And then went based off of that, they asked me if I was okay with reading for the female lead. And I was like, I sure I am. Wow. Um, and then they put me in a, a little room, another room with uh, like literally one light over a boardroom table surrounded by all this creepy stuff. Uh-huh. It gave me like five minutes to to work on like six or seven pages of dialogue. And like in the one scene, I my character like had to. It's called for her because she like the guy was frozen. I don't want to spoil the movie, but he was in, immobilized. And my character to show power and dominance, like licks him. So like literally, I walked into the first part of the audition, and I was like, um, "Hi, I'm Jessica," and the actor is reading with was named Chris, a sweetheart of a guy, and we would become friends after. And I'm like, "So is it okay if I lick you and kiss you?" <laughs> Like, sure. Uh, Knock okay. yourself out. Yeah, right. Uh, but it was so funny because we had um, Gary Jones reading fiction. And in the middle of the scene, like, he just like he just got so into the scene, he forgot to read the stage direction. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, like, that upper pause where I'm like, you're supposed to be a job. Um, so, yeah. So it was perfect. Um, but so I, I go out and I work on this other part of the scene and I come back in and then they start asking me about, you know, my availability and we ran some improv and I have a really awesome horror movie scream that I didn't know I had until this audition. Um, so we're, you know, we're talking all the details and the specifics, um, about like, you know, can I do it? Can I take four weeks off of work? Um, luckily for me, the company I was working with was pretty easy about that kind of stuff. You know, I definitely could have just because I had so much vacation time that I never used. Um, so that was all fine and good. And then I was so heartbroken because after all that, they, you know, somebody on the higher up was like, nope, all the leads have to come from LA. What? So and then, I, and so you got cut? Uh, they gave me a smaller role. Uh, and they actually cast like a really pretty blonde girl uh, that's so funny it's like when I was on set everyone was like you look just like her I was like yes I know oh, uh, um, but it was you know honestly it's fine you know I had my I went and I approved it and realized that like you know what people say in the audition rooms doesn't necessarily translate so to like you know to actually what happens so when they in the room and they're asking me about my availability can I book it off da 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 so I literally went the next day and I was like, I need to book off these four weeks. I shot, I'm going to shoot this movie. So it was like a really harsh lesson to go back and be like, so about that? It's not happening. Yeah. They gave me like a much smaller role that I have to shoot in like a day. No, but it, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, it was still fun. I, I still loved working with them. It would have been insane to actually get and shoot a lead role anyways in a, you know, such a large scale feature film for my first audition ever. But it was an, it was very interesting from a story standpoint. Well, I mean, and what a compliment that is too. On your first audition, you go in, and with the talent and the look you have, they automatically bump you up to the lead role. And just because the higher ups said it had to be from LA, you know, I mean, that's still awesome that they thought that highly of you on your first audition. Yeah, it's great, and I've maintained friendship with both of them now, and I still hope to work with them again. Um, and I, I had so much fun on the set. It was a really, really great time, honestly. And they were such great guys. And I loved, like, the rest of the casting crew. They were wonderful. So it's one of the things where it is what it is. Right. And at the end of the day, you can't win them all. So the fact that I came so close on, like, my first time out of the door, you know, is just, it is what it is. I think, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a huge accomplishment, in my, in my opinion. 
thank you. I, you know, I took it as such, and I, I still, like, you know, when they said, well, we want you for this, can you do that? I was like, sure. You know, happy to help out. So right. you will see me, I'm, like, female victim. I'm in, like, the big battle scene. <laughs> I would love to be a victim in a, in a horror fun. movie. Dude, it's a lot of fun. Well, uh, okay, I want to... It comes in big blood, and sometimes it's sticky and unpleasant. I can imagine that, yeah, and I hate sticky stuff, but, like, is the fake blood, Is it, do they all use one type of fake blood for all different sets, or is it different in different movies? No, it's totally different in every movie, um, and, like, whether it stains your clothing, your skin, totally different depending upon the ingredients that they use, Yeah. and then some, you know, it also depends because different blood looks different on different types of cameras, so it depends, like, are you shooting HD? Nowadays, like, a year ago... You had to ask that more than you do now. Pretty much everything people shoot now is like HD or on like a red or really pretty. But you still have to ask technically. So little things like that can make different types of blood look different. Does it does yeah. it does it have a pleasant taste? Um, it just sort of depends on like the concoction that they use. The ones that are really artificial are kind of very unpleasant. Um, there's ones that are predominantly just sugar, red food coloring, and chocolate syrup, and they taste fine. Right. There's ones that, I don't know what they put into it, but it tastes like minty chocolate, which is weird, but yeah. it's fine. To be, you have to be careful, too, because, like, you know, depending upon how old the blood is, you don't want to get it in your mouth, right? Right. Because people have gotten sick from having bacteria in the blood enter into their mouth. Uh, so you have to be really careful. Anything that's going in, like, if you're using any kind of mouth blood, it has to be something that you've made specifically for you know that day kind of thing to go into your mouth safely well that makes a lot of sense um yes but it's something that a lot of people forget and it's just because like you know bacteria some people and because blood can get really expensive we literally went through like costings of blood and it was we spent on truth or dare we spent like four or five hundred dollars just on fake blood so it can add up really quickly but it was so funny because she, when we were putting together our budget, Carrie Mercado, our special effects uh, genius, came to us and she was like, we can literally do the three tiers of blood. It could be like 150, 250, or 400, 450, whatever it was. Um, you know, it depends on what look are you going for, what looks the most real, you know. So, so there's all different ways to do it and different ones look better on camera than others. And in my opinion, you shouldn't skip on the blood. Oh, no, and... I mean, have you seen the the new Evil Dead movie? I mean, the entire last scene is just raining blood out of the sky. Like, a lot of the horror movies, it's just, you get drenched in blood, it looks like. Yes. I loved, I loved that part of the Evil Dead. I didn't like the movie itself, but I liked the effects, and I liked all the blood. Yeah, it wasn't, I mean, it was a fine reboot, I guess, but to me, like, I had to see it, because it was the new Evil Dead movie, you know? Oh, we all had to. Yeah. That, that's like the... You know, the twisted trap is like, we have to go see it, but at the same time, it kills us. Sure. You know, because we're like, we just died a little inside. <laughs> That's exactly, we, we had a discussion after we went and saw it, you know, a couple months back. That's pretty much the same exact opinion that we had of it. So, uh, well, how did you become a Scream Queen? Was that something that you set out to do, or is that something you just kind of fell into? Were you always a fan of horror movies? You know, I was always a fan of horror movies, but I never really, you know, in the act, in the wonderful world that is film, you don't ever sit down and be like, or at least I don't. I guess there are people who do, but they don't tend to work very much. You don't really sit down and be like, I'm going to do this type of film, right? It's kind of like, here's what I'm getting offered, and do I want to pay my bills this month? You know what I mean? So right. it just sort of happened that in the Midwest, they shoot a lot of horror films. So I did the horror. If you would have asked me four, five, six, seven, eight years ago, what is your preference for film? What do you want to do? I would have told you in a heartbeat horror. But I didn't set out that well. It wasn't my original intention. You know, because you just you don't have that control. I just wanted to work. So right. my whole my my whole process from the get go was just, you know, let's work on the best quality projects regardless of genre. And it just happened that a lot of them were horror. And it does seem like a lot of the a lot of the independent movies today, the majority of them are horror movies. I mean, the first performance I saw you in was The Sleeper, and love that movie. That that was a great movie, and that was a, a tragic death that you suffered in that movie. Yes, it was. Man, what'd you? I, I was like, why did you die? I'm like, because they could afford me for three days. <laughs> <laughs> love Justin, uh, but this is like honestly the the bane of you know honestly. 
independent, low-budget films are that you've got this amount of money, you know, how many days can that afford you? Right. Uh, but I hope to work with him again because I think he's just brilliant, quite frankly. I Any any movie that comes out that is like a, a retro, you know, it. I, I believe even the release was in like a retro kind of big box VHS. They did, yeah, they did a limited edition VHS tape. I actually just saw one for the first time at uh, Italy Fest in Florida. Yeah. I was like, hell yes. I thought it was so fresh and so original. Oh, man. Anything like that, I'm, I'm so into. Like, I'll be the first one there to buy it. That, that is such a cool idea. I know. And it's such a great way to connect with fans. Exactly. How do you – so you said that you have, like, a really a really good scream. How do you prepare, like, for a really intense, scary scene where you're running and screaming and someone's chasing you? You know what? Honestly, as far as that kind of stuff goes, it's really just about hitting the gym and making sure that you have the stamina to do it ten times, a hundred times from different angles, close-ups, wides. You know what I mean? Because it's just – it's physically exhausting. So you really only, in my opinion, should practice on, like, keeping the physicality up because anything else, you'll try to force the emotion. And if you're – you know what I mean? As – we've all been scared in our lives, so it's not hard to access what that would feel or look like to be running from something in the woods. Mm-hmm. I'm, I always just focus on, you know, like, the emotion will be there. If you have the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the character, the emotion will come. So I'm less concerned with that. I, I'm always just more concerned and more focused on making sure that I can physically do it. And because keep in mind, like you see it, it might be like three minutes of that movie, but we shot that, you know, literally over nine and a half hours where I was wow. running in the cold, in the woods, in the dark, in heels. <laughs> and I guess after a certain time, doesn't it get like to where you're just tired? I mean, obviously you get tired, but you're just, you. it's almost like you can't give as good of a performance after nine hours. Is that ever the case? You know, it can be, but it's usually like just so physically, you get so physically worn out that it's hard to do anything. That's why making sure that you're in the shape to do it physically is crucial. Um, what what is the what what would you say would be the best and worst thing about being an actress? Um, it's the best thing is just the fun and the people that you meet. It's like a family every time you're on a new set, which is kind of totally awesome. You know. So I love, love, love that aspect. Um, but, like, as far as, like, what is a bad thing, it probably just, like, the inconsistency of work. You know, it's not a – here's the thing. With being an actor, it comes with a lifestyle adjustment. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you have to – you simply must get used to not having, like, a regular paycheck, per se. You know, some months are better than others. You have to plan. You have to do this. You have to do all these things. Um, and – you have to be okay with that. Some people aren't, and that's totally fine. Um, and some people are like, yeah, but you know, being an actor is about the art. It is about the art. However, it's crucial that you can tolerate that side of it because it's such a big aspect. It affects your life every day. And it seems like also, I guess, you you might have to go away for months at a time, you know? Yes, you have to, like, travel. You have to be flexible. Um, and not just months at a time, like, you know, there's time where it's like you'll have to drive three hours to an audition. So guess what? If you don't like driving, it might not be the career for you. Or it might make it so that you can't necessarily do it full time per se. You know, where you might not be able to do it to the extent that your competitive competition can. You know, some people don't like the, you know, memorizing lines. You know, like our, the job is so, it's much more of a lifestyle than I think what a lot of people give it credit for. Mm-hmm. And that can make it really difficult for some to adjust to it. So I always tell people, I'm like, just understand it's a lifestyle. And we can stand here and say, but it shouldn't be, you know, it's not about whether it should or shouldn't be. It is. You know, whether you want it to be or not, it's a lifestyle. Let's go into some listener questions that have been sent in. Um, sure. Yeah. Gray Sunset wants to know what's in your DVD player right now. My DVD right now is a wonderful independent film called Wrath of the Crows by Ivan Zukan. It's a, it's a film that was made over in Italy, and I'm a huge fan of his work, um, starring Debbie Rashawn. So I actually haven't seen it yet, because I literally just put it in, uh-huh. and it's going to be the next thing that I watch. Oh, that's awesome. So I guess you watch it. I mean, obviously, you have to watch a lot of independent um, movies just because you know you might be working with these people in the near future. Yes, well, and that's always the goal. 
So I, I do. I watch as many independent films as I can, and I love the independent films. So it's always great to see, you know, who doing what, where, when, why, how are they? Are they good? You know, and now that I'm into producing more as well, I want to see, like, actors that I might be interested in casting or bringing on board, you know, what have they done? How, you know, how are they perceived? How does the camera see them? You know, can they get that character arc? You know, and also, like, making sure that the stories I'm saying are original and fresh stories. So that also comes into play. Man, there's so much that goes into a movie that people really don't think about whenever they sit down for two, two and a half hours and just watch it. They never really realize exactly how much work goes into making a movie. Oh, it's completely insane. Jeez. Um, okay, Boney the Man asks, if you've ever encountered any deranged fans? Um, you know what? I do. I, I'm a big fan of I block pretty quickly yeah. now on social media. Um, because you just sort of have to, um, in my opinion. So I block all the time, uh, just when people sort of cross that line. And there's people that they just, sometimes people just don't understand the boundaries that are required in like the whole, you see me in movies and I'm, I respond to you when you give a post on my Facebook page or something. It's not like I'm, you know, I, I, I do genuinely appreciate the fact that you saw the film and felt enough about it and me to reach out to me and that's so nice of you yeah but that doesn't mean that i'm in the market for a new best friend or that i need photos of you or (laughs) or that you need to be really creepastic Uh, so i block a lot um but there's been you know times where it's just like you get a little bit concerned and there's you know it's honestly the funny thing is really not even fans are usually the fans are usually a great part it's usually these like parasites within the industry who are these like either want to be filmmakers or want to be actors and didn't star in a movie or you call that all their bullshit or you get past them um so those are the people that i usually have more of a problem with outside of the fans usually like with the fans i could just be real and be like yo back up you know that's a little bit inappropriate um, and they're respectful of it. It's usually, like I said, the wannabe filmmakers or actors. Oh wow! I can't. Not so like, so film. So if you pass on on somebody's film, sometimes they'll kind of just like stalk you and just give you shit about it. Oh, they'll get so upset. Especially, I'm a really honest person. So you know, it's not. It's not. It has happened before, where I've been like, I'm passing on this film because I don't believe that you have the money to finance it. I believe that you're lying to me, and I don't believe you're telling me the whole truth. You know, and I say this without judgment, it's just this is why I'm passing. Uh, and sometimes people get really upset, and ironically, I've never been wrong yet. You know, wow. it's, it's a prove me wrong, make the damn movie, show me that you have the money, and then they don't. Uh, but they'll get really, 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 really upset about it. Well, or like the one time I, I read the draft, and it was a really bad script. Uh, and the filmmaker kept on prodding, and I just leveled with him. I said, dude, I just didn't respond to the script. It wasn't my thing. You know, and he's like, but what about the characters? I was like, I didn't like them. What about this? I didn't like it. <laughs> um, and it's something where it's like every six months or so, I hear from this individual, you know, with some, like, snide, dumbass remark about how, like, I thought I was too good for a script. And I'm like, no, that wasn't it at all. I just didn't like it. Oh, my gosh. Well, and... In that in that instance, I mean, honesty is the best policy. You don't want to lead anybody on if you're not into it from the beginning. Why even go for exactly. it? Exactly, and I like would never want to spend time doing that. You know. Sure. Let's see. Orange Lazarus asked in, um, "How awkward is filming a sex scene?" You know what? A sex scenes. Okay, so they're not as awkward as what you would think, right? Like usually they're a closed set. If they're good filmmakers or if you have a good relationship, you can ask them to close the set. It's pretty standard that like unless you need to be there. So you have a sound guy, cinematographer, your DP, camera guy, director. But there's not like a lot of superfluous hangers on. Right. You know, around. So it's usually in my experience, because as an actor you're like so in the moment. It's less awkward for the actors in the set and more awkward for everybody else in the room. Like everybody else, like the sound guy, has to make sure his boom's on in the shot and that he's getting the audio, but it's kind of like it's like awkward moment if you're doing it well because it feels like you're like in that room where those people are having sex that you shouldn't necessarily be in. Right. So in my experience, it's not as awkward for the actors. It's more awkward for everyone else. And because like usually the actors, it's like we've been there, we've done that, you know, 
it's just another day at the office for us. Mm-hmm. So it's usually pretty funny to watch other people's facial reactions because they're usually the ones that are really creeped out by it. I think that's uh, that makes a lot of sense because if I was like if I was one of the guys holding the booms or something, I think at some point I would forget like that it was filming a movie and I just close my eyes all of a sudden like oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, and then like you ruin the shot and we're all cranky. Yeah, exactly. Into the, yeah, and we're like damn it. <laughs> you ruined it. Gosh darn it. So yeah, not so awkward for us. Awkward for everyone else. They usually the the one awkward that can can happen depending on the set is when you don't know the other actor. And there's like this awkward, like it's like that. It's essentially like a much more intense version of when you were in grade seven, and the boys and the girls were at a dance, and the girls were on one side and the boys were on the other side, and the teacher like forces two of the kids to dance. It's like that times a million. Yeah, oh, I bet. When you haven't met the other actor, because a lot of the time sex scenes will happen like on the first day of shooting, because they want to make sure that they're going to get it from you without you being difficult. Right. So they'll make you do it on the first day, right? Which is fine. But if you don't know the other actor, that can be a little bit, you know, special because there's this whole, like, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put my mouth on your neck now and, you know, and it's just sort of like, okay, we're going to do that. So, but, you know, usually if you're, if you're smart and you've been the, down this road before, you'll just reach out to the other actor and be like, hey, buddy, we're going to be fake having sex in about a week and a half. We should yeah. probably get to know each other. <laughs> you know? So, a lot, and, you know, social media has made it so much easier to get a hold of everyone, including future co-stars, to really no excuse for not being able to get a hold of anyone now. And then a couple more questions that got sent in. Uh, Dewey N wants to know what type of music you listen to. You know what? This is like the question that I dread because I'm a horrible person when it comes to music. And the answer is, truthfully, I don't really listen to any type of music. Uh-huh. I worked in the bar industry for years. So I have an unfortunate, natural, unintentional ability to tune music out. Sure, I can see that. You know, because it was just sort of a survival tactic when I was in school. So I always feel really bad because I think music is so crucial to filmmaking and to artists everywhere except me. So I'm usually listening to Top 40 as much as I cringe. And I know that I shouldn't say that. Uh, It's usually Top 40. If I have, like, as far as CDs, I'm still... I still love, 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 love Bon Jovi. I'll always love Bon Jovi. He's like one of my go-to. Love him. Uh, I love film soundtracks, Mm -hmm. you know, because they like remind me of the film itself. It was a good movie. So love that. Um, And I love, I love musical scores that you don't realize are there until after the fact. And, you know, that's really a tough question for, for anybody. I mean, I am a complete music nerd. And I cringe at that question too because I, I can't tell you who my who my favorite you know musician is. It's just it's a terrible question to be asked. I'm sorry I threw that at you. Oh, that's okay. It's just <laughs> one of those things where it's like I know that I know that as an artist and as a person, I am lacking when it comes to that. You know what I mean? So it's like my weakest moment as a person is my musical indulgences. And then one more from our, our good friend at Many Killer. He has two questions. The first one would be, what is your favorite movie or movies? And um, he also asks, what what do you want to accomplish in being an actress? Awesome. So, okay. And this is my slight disclaimer because sometimes people will catch me and be like, but I thought you said this was your favorite movie. My favorite movie does – I'm one of those people that gets cravings for films, not unlike pregnant women get for, like, pickles and ice cream. Right. So it will change sometimes. But – uh, two of my favorite all-time films that I can watch all day long, any and every day, uh, would be Natural Born Killers. Yes. Right? Which is, to me, should be a staple of every film film fan's collection ever. Um, it's got uh, everything you'd want in a movie, really. It does. It's amazing. It's a breathtaking piece of cinema. Um, and the acting, everything about it is spectacular, in my opinion. Um, so, and I, I consider it a horror film. I know some horror fans don't. I do. I'm like, you have the body count, you have the blood, you have the gore, you've got serial killers. Mm -hmm. It's horror. But, uh, I know that I get into debates with that sometimes. Uh, and then also I love, love martyrs or like a horror film Uh Martyrs is just amazing. I haven't checked that one out yet. I'm I'm going to have... Gosh, you must. You should put it in your queue instantly. You know what it is, too? I Okay, so here's, like, the thing. When you're, like, such a fan of the film, 
uh, the actual director, I want to say, I've blocked him out of my name, my memory because he did something really bad after this. Uh oh. Yeah, it was Pascal Laurier. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why I. Here's the thing. So I saw the Tall Man, which he did after. So if anyone's listening to this, and you haven't seen Martyrs and you've seen the Tall Man, I'm so worried. Please don't hold it against the director because the Tall Man was a horrible film. It was horrible. It was ridiculous. The story didn't make any sense. The characters sucked. The acting was mediocre. The writing was bad. Um, and he directed that as well. But Martyrs, his film prior that he did in 2008 is a breathtaking piece of cinema. Well, I'll, I'll look forward to checking that out, then. That sounds pretty awesome. Oh, it's so... And it's, it's one of those movies, too, where it's, like, it's so good on so many levels, you know? it's It's got amazing visuals. It's got spectacular sound. It's so... It attacks you on the forefront with the opening scene, which is just mind-blowing awesome. And it just keeps going. And it by the end of the movie, it's... It affects everyone that I've ever heard of on such a deep level. It's it's so amazing and powerful that a film can do that. There are so many films too that you know everybody everybody will will watch it and feel a different way. Like I'm I'm a huge fan of like the Rob Zombie films, and I know I get a lot of people that are just like, eh, they're a little too cartoony. I don't really like them that much, but. I, I thought House of a Thousand Corpses was, was probably one of my favorite scary movies in the last, like, five to ten years, I would say. Yeah, I really liked House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, he's... I also love The Devil's Rejects. I think that, you know, just Bill Mosley and, and the whole group did an amazing job. Mm-hmm. Have, have you seen his uh, his newest one, uh, Lords of Salem? I have. I I was not a huge fan of it. I really wasn't either. It, it wasn't. I felt like it was Rob Zombie trying not to be as Rob Zombie and try to be something a little bit different. Which, See, as like a filmmaker, I look at that and I'm like, oh wow, you had a hard production, buddy. Yeah. Uh, and I went to I went to actually a, a screening where him and Sherry were there, and they were talking about the film, and that's essentially like it. Just they were under so many constraints, and they had so there's fifty really billion reasons as to why. The movie didn't work out the way that it, it they had intended it to. Yeah. But whenever I found that, I was like, oh, that makes sense now. You wanted to make a good movie. It just didn't happen. But that being said, I, I know some people love it. Yeah, and, and I could I could see how some people could love it. I just went in, you know, expecting House of a Thousand Corpses or Devil's Rejects or something along those veins. And it was something completely different. And oh, absolutely. It had something a little different, too, that, like... Uh, you know, like it was, it was a really scary movie, especially at the end. It was, it was just like you, you got just bombarded with all these, all these crazy, like a collage of crazy pictures, and just it, it was terrifying on a whole different level. See, it didn't really bother me at all. Cause I didn't really know what was going on. It seemed like some type of propaganda film, didn't it? Towards the end. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, like the creepy guy, at like the one scene. I was like, it's cool. You just have to run away from that monster. He's not moving. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't. It's like it, things like that just don't bother me because I'm like, whatever, just run. It's just another day in Hollywood. That guy hangs out at Sunset and you know Highland all the time. <laughs> like, don't worry, I know that you showed up randomly at a apartment in Boston, but, but no. Like the funny thing was that I. Uh, and they, it was this came from Bobby. He was speaking about it so candidly. He was rewriting the script every day. So every day the actors would get a new twelve pages. And according to him, the only thing that is the same from the movie that he had hired the actors based off of, mm -hmm. and the final product of the film is that Sherry Moon Zombie and Ken Foray's characters worked at a radio station. That makes sense because just just that alone seems kind of like the basis of a Rob Zombie film. I could see how from there it could have gone awry. But everything else about the movie changed. And then also... Perspective, when you're like, oh, now I understand why the movie didn't know what it was. It did kind of have that feel, didn't it? Like, it just kind of... Absolutely. Yeah. But this is what happens when every day you rewrite the damn thing. And it's in other some other people's hands, too, I'm sure. I think he... I think it was pretty much his. Oh, uh, well, okay. Honest. Yeah. Yeah, I think he handled it was like such a low budget. That was the other thing that he talked about, which is so funny to me because I think it was like nine hundred thousand dollars. Which, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a fair amount of money to make an independent film. It's actually a lot of money to make an independent film, and you know, certainly if you're Rob Zombie and people do everything you want for free, <laughs> you know, it should be fine. Uh, but that being said, it was he felt it was too low to make a movie off of, wow. and I was like, oh wow, that's like more money than 
probably 99% of all my movies combined. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, it's ironic is what it is. And you're like, wait a second. And then uh, at Many Killer also asks, what, what have you set to accomplish? What do you want to accomplish with being an actress? Is there any set goal? You know, I, of course, like you want the Oscars and you want the Emmys, you know, and all those things are wonderful to put on your mantle. And I do joke about seriously wanting them because uh, I think it's funny and cheeky. But at the end of the day, I am so happy when I'm able to pay my bills. And I'm really thrilled when I make something that people can get behind and be enthusiastic to watch or see. Like the film that we just shot, which is Truth or Dare, which was my directorial debut, and I actually co-wrote it too. I'm just thrilled that people give a shit about it, you know, that people want to see it, that right. people are so excited about it. That just is crazy and wild to me. And I guess you're, you're right. At the end of the day, you're paying your bills, you're doing something that you love, and you're reaching out and, like, touching several people that are that are watching it. Exactly. You know, that's a great way to pay your bills. Yes. And I just want to keep making original, fresh content, you know? Uh-huh. I don't want to... I just, I want to keep on entertaining people and, and making people feel stuff and, and showing them cool things they haven't seen before and, and letting people into my mind, you know, which is what Truth or Dare was. It was this crazy concept I had, starting with this villain character that I had, you know, that people seem to be really gravitated towards. So, you know, I want to do more of that. I want to continue to tell the stories that I want to see as a fan that aren't here. And I, I was going through your IMDb page, and I, I want to know a little bit more about Truth or Dare. It, it seems like a really a really interesting project that you're working on, but it, I don't see how you have time for anything because it, it just shows that you have so many movies right now that are in production. Like, how do you have time to, to do anything? Well, you work a lot. I like to, you know, I always, I, I literally, you know, we work seven-hour days, essentially, and we work, you know, 18-hour days pretty much, uh, but, like, I'm lucky, too, like, the other films, when you're just an actor on a film, you literally show up, you get your size, you show up, and you do the scenes, and then you leave, and then you might show up at the premiere or something, but that's pretty much it, however, so, you can see how that's not as time-consuming as when you're, like, the director or the writer, where it's, like, a much more all-my-life-consuming endeavor, you know, you still have to promote it, you still have to do all this stuff, but it's not, it's not quite on the same level as when you're a director or producer of the project. Right. So that's why you'll see that, you know, I've got several projects that I am, but I only do one of those at a time. The other thing about being an actor is, like, some of the stuff, you know, it just, when you're an actor, you're working on somebody else's timeline, you know? So, you know, that movie that I did, um, my, and I might have honestly done two years ago, might just be coming out now. Oh, wow. But I've not worked on it in two years. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like, uh... The Legend of Grassman, which is in post-production. I shot that in, I think it was 2011. Yeah, it was before I moved to L.A. So, I mean, you know, yeah, I'm totally in it, and I love the people behind it, and as soon as it's done, I'll promote the crap out of it. But I haven't really had to do anything on it for two years, other than mention it in interviews. Um, you know, To Jennifer was shot earlier this year. I Grim Becoming, I just shot in uh, Buffalo, and that was super fun. Uh, Mother's Blood, same thing. Mother's Blood was 2010. Wow. And yeah, so so it's and it's like one of the things where you just have to have, you just you have to keep working away at it because it's you know you have a gap in your schedule if you're not constantly working. So a lot of them, it's like yeah, I am working on them or I just recently worked on them. But even like a grim becoming, you know, I shot that. I don't have anything more to do with that because I'm just an actor in it until it comes out, and then I'll just promote it, which is not going to take much time. Tell me a little bit more about Truth or Dare and what we what we can expect and you know when when we'll be able to to check it out. Absolutely. It's it's honestly this bloody, vicious, mean uh, torture flick. Uh, and it centers around a main character who just wants to be famous and he just wants friends. And effectively, uh, he he's that guy that we all know. He's actually modeled off the, off of, after an actor that I know specifically. Um and because I was like, I wonder what would make this guy snap. So in our story, six people get internet films, or they get internet success overnight by making a Truth or Dare video. And in our world, uh, this leads him to sort of start his spiral into madness because he wants what they have. And, and he 
kind of takes them hostage and forces them to play by his own rules. And it gets really bloody and really nasty really quickly. Wow, that sounds really awesome. Um, when, when can I expect to be able to, to see this movie? Well, luckily for us, we're right now we're in post-production. So we're expecting uh, to be doing festivals in the fall and hopefully into the new year. And then ideally we'll get a distribution uh, deal and be out sometime in 2014. That's kind of out of our hands. It's sort of like when the distributor want to do it. So fingers crossed, stay tuned. Mm-hmm. You can go to... Uh, www.truthordarethemovie.com and we still have like our contribution section up so you can for $25 you can pre-order a copy of the movie which means as soon as it's done and we've done our festival runs before finalizing our distribution deal we're going to send out copies to like the hardcore fans so you can definitely check that out um, just our way of sort of making sure that we can get it to the fans sooner because it always sucks because you know in theory we could sign a distribution deal on January 2014 and they could say guess what we're going to release your movie to American audiences on March 2015 wow you know and that has happened it sucks but it happens and that's that's a really cool way too to give back like like you're talking about do like a pre-release and then send out the DVDs to the to the real fans of the movie because with with social media and everything nowadays, there are people that can't wait to get their hands on it. And unfortunately for them, it's it's whoever, like you said, whoever is up to releasing it. So that's really awesome that you're sending out copies like that. Oh, absolutely. And go forward, what we want to do is we want to sort of, you know, we kept, uh, we did an Indiegogo campaign. It was really great because it enabled us to get in touch with the fans so much better, so much quicker. So it's keeping these people on board of like our progress and what we're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And making sure that everyone's on the same page and getting them involved. And the goal, ideally, is to make sure that, guess what? You know, the next film that we make, you're on the email list. You're getting the -the behind-the-scenes photos because you've been with us for this long. You know? So the goal is to continue doing it and then keep on amplifying it. And this this movie is uh, I would imagine this is this is your baby, right? I mean, you you directed, you wrote, you starred in. Yes, and I'll never direct and star again. It's a nightmare. I don't recommend it. That was my next question: is if you'd ever do that again? It no. seems like it'd be a tremendous amount of work. No, nope, never, never again. I'm not. That's no, nope, never. Wow. Well, no, nope, it's just too freaking difficult. I can't. Yeah, I can't imagine doing it. And there are a lot of actors that probably never go through with it, just because it seems like just a shitload of work to go through. It is, and it's like one of the things where it's just so. It's just so difficult because it directly conflicts with each other right you know what i mean so it's one of the things where you're just better off to not in my opinion don't ever do it i tell everyone i'm like don't it's a no it's an absolute freaking nightmare don't do it you know they just you were either behind the camera or you're in front of the camera but don't try to do both so everybody we're all gonna we're all gonna stay tuned into truth or dare and see whenever it comes out i can't wait to see it like i said so um i've kept you for almost an hour at this point you know i'd i'd like to thank you so much for calling in. Um, My absolute pleasure. We'll have to do round two. Oh yeah, absolutely. And before you go, just just one question. Um, I guess, what kind of advice would you give to somebody that wants to break into acting? You know, I think to really look at it strategically and have a plan. You know, plan out. You know, plan to have your lifestyle upgraded and changed. I always tell people, I'm like, for at least a couple of years prior to, you know, cut down all expenses. You know, don't have cable, pack a lunch, don't eat out, don't go out, you know, these kind of things. But that's what it's going to take. Um, and then just really hustle. So the reality of the matter is, in our world, you don't have time to be sitting and not doing anything. You know, mm-hmm. you never see me without my laptop or phone in my hands unless I'm in a meeting. Period. Because there's not enough hours in the day. There's just not. Um, so to really be prepared to, if you want to do it as a full-time job, be prepared to work harder than you've ever worked in your life, and good things can come. But also, to know that, guess what, if you're one of those people that needs a regular income, that doesn't want to, you know, that that wants to go off and buy their lunch every day, and, you know, you don't want to give up these comforts that you've grown accustomed to, that's fine. You're probably more of a weekend warrior kind of actor, which is totally fine, where you work a day job and make a fair amount of money and then you do it on the weekend, which is cool. I think the trick is just knowing which one you are. Because if you, you can't have both. You can't, uh, you know, be spending large amounts of money when you're trying to do a creative career for the first couple of years. It's just too difficult. 
So really figure out where your priority lies and understand that it's a lifestyle choice. It's not just a career. Unfortunately, like being a starving artist is a lifestyle choice. <laughs> yeah, I know. Unfortunately, that, that, and that makes a lot of sense too. So people can reach you at jessicacameron.com, um, on Twitter at Jessica Cameron, and also on your uh, IMDb, IMDb page at Jessica Cameron. I love how you keep it simple like that. You can't go wrong. Yeah. No, we've got to be easily findable, easily accessible. Is there anywhere else that people can people can get in touch with you, or is, are those the main main ones? Those are the main ones. Like I'm always, you'll see, I'm always on Facebook. I'm always on my Twitter. Obviously, I'm a huge Twitter fan. I'm actually a Twitteraholic. I wonder if they make a, they should make some kind of program for that. Um, <laughs> they will soon, I'm sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for calling in, and and yeah, I, I would love to do a round two in the near future, and uh, maybe even after Truth or Dare comes out, we can see where uh, where you're at then. Awesome. I would love that. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. And we're going to take a short break, and we will be back after these messages. 